Now, from the most trusted names in local news, KDPG Sunday Edition. Good morning and welcome to the KDPG Sunday Edition. I'm Ken Rice. It has happened again and this time here at home. A student causes mass, ca mass casualties at a high school and terror in the community. In this case, the weapon wasn't a gun. On Wednesday, a student at Franklin Regional High School in Murraysville went on a rampage with two 8-inch kitchen knives. KDK's Trina Orlando was among the first on the scene as the tragedy unfolded. The sights and sounds will never be forgotten by students and staff at Franklin Regional High School. They were just arriving for class when a nightmare unfolded around them. The investigation revealed that the subject had two knives and uh, went down the hallway um, in slashing motion. 16-year-old Alex Ribel has been charged as an adult with attempted homicide and aggravated assault. Police allege the sophomore stabbed 22 people, including fellow students and a security guard. Two others were also injured. He's confused, depressed. I think he's probably trying to figure out why this happened himself as we're trying to figure it out. FBI agents searched Rivals Murraysville home and confiscated his computer. They also interviewed witnesses and victims. Counseling services are already being made available to anyone in the community who may need them. When I look at the situation with our high school teachers, when they come back, they were firsthand involved in the trauma. And so we will be providing them counseling services up through Monday and continuing. Stories of bravery and heroism have spread throughout the community. Acts of selflessness that are no surprise to those who live here. Murraysville is a large community, but it's a small town. I think that's the way you have to look at it. Uh, when things happen like this, people put the barriers down and lend a hand and help out one another. I'm Trina Orlando, KDK TV News. This morning on the KDPG Sunday edition, the Franklin Regional Tragedy and how the community can recover. With us is Gene Cummender, Emergency Management Coordinator with North Huntington Township, not far from Murraysville. Gene was not involved in the response on Wednesday. He's also Vice President of One Star Training, which helps organizations and communities with security and emergency planning. Also with us is Vanessa Mayers, Community Engagement and Mediation Specialist for the Center for Victims. It's the largest nonprofit victim service agency in Allegheny County. It also seeks to foster a more peaceful community. Welcome to both of you. Welcome also to my co-host David Schriman, executive editor of the Post Gazette. Forgive me, it's Commander. Yes, I apologize. Um, this incident uh, at Franklin Regional it struck so many of us because uh, for many reasons, but it seemed to be unusual in that knives were used. This seemed to be a very unusual method of attack. Uh, what was your initial reaction to that, Gene? Uh, again, it's uh, the weapon of choice in, in past incidents uh, has always been a firearm, uh, a weapon, and uh, knives, uh, from what I've read and uh, information has been provided, uh, says that it's a much more personal uh, means of attacking someone. You don't have to do it from a distance. You have to closely encounter someone uh, in order to inflict uh, a wound with a knife. And, you know, I don't pretend to know the psychology of it, uh, nor, you know, what gave rise uh, to these actions, you know, in the mind of this, uh, uh, this poor child. But um, for whatever reason, that's what he decided to use. Much more personal, and I've heard others say that as well. And yet, uh, the suspect's lawyer and police are indicating that these appear to be just random attacks. Uh, what, what were your thoughts when you heard about what was happening over there? Um, I was very surprised by what happened, although we've been seeing a lot of that in the schools, with more so with firearms and other um, weapons. Um, but yes, this individual at the time, um, for some reason, felt that it was necessary to use a knife or two knives, and, um, and it was random just from the standpoint of the amount of people that were around. A uh, very different scenario when it's not a gun. It is, uh, and I think it goes to uh, the type of reaction, really. I think there was uh, confusion initially as to what was actually happening on the scene. I mean, with the gun, you can put two plus two together. You hear bang, bang, you see people running, you kind of have an idea of what they're running from or what the cause uh, was immediately. Here, you hear reports that uh, people didn't know what was happening, and all of a sudden, injured people were essentially just materializing in front of people, and it added to the confusion in those uh, crowded hallways. And it, it took a couple of minutes to figure out exactly what you know the cause of this was. So you're in emergency management. You you think about emergencies. You plan the response to emergencies. You you. You work to anticipate emergencies. Is this the type of incident you plan for that you think about? 
In emergency management, we spend a lot of our time trying to answer the question, what if? And we what if scenarios to death. And then when we get to what we think is an effective conclusion, we say, what if? Um, and, and the knee-jerk reaction to this might be, okay, now we've got to start to concentrate on knife attacks, okay? That's not really what you want to do. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security and its efforts to, uh, to, to uh, prepare for these types of things espouses an all-hazards approach, uh, which is essentially uh, trying to take into account anything that might happen and then uh, plan your response accordingly. So you can't really spend a lot of time, unless it's a readily identifiable threat through, through a hazard analysis that you've uh, done through a threat assessment, and you've come to determine that this is the specific type of hazard we're going to likely encounter, then you spend an appropriate amount of time focusing on that particular hazard. Absent that information, you really have to address it from an all-hazards approach. As an emergency management uh, professional, what opinion do you have from what you know about the response at Franklin Regional? And we should say you've worked in that school. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to be involved in a uh, training exercise that was conducted there at the school district uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I was also able to uh, serve as an evaluator at Forbes uh, Regional Hospital in two exercises that they conducted within the last year and a half or so. There is no doubt in my mind that the effectiveness of the response uh, to that incident this past week was due in, in no small part to the fact that they have uh, trained for this kind of stuff in the past, they had an emergency plan in place, they practice that plan, you play like you practice. If you don't practice these things, you have no right to expect that you'll respond well when these things happen. But this happened before classes were actually in session and the fire alarm was pulled. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, does the plan call for that? I don't know that that's a specific part of uh, the Franklin Regional Plan. So, so uh, w when you say it went according to plan, what happened there that was prepared for and executed? Their, their plan called for, again, identifying what was going on and then an immediate response from the emergency services community. And then while that's going on, you have an external response, but you have an internal response uh, from the school district as well. The school district uh, would have uh, activated uh, its emergency operations center. Uh, that follows an incident command uh, format. Somebody's in charge of that incident. Somebody's in charge of responding to that incident. Somebody is responsible for uh, the internal response. Somebody's responsible for... Uh, uh, communicating with the external response agencies and that's what facilitates an effective response to an incident. Let's take a step back or two steps back for just a second. We all know that the rate of violence in the United States is down substantially in the past several years. We also know that the the number of spectacular horrifying episodes like this is up. What accounts for all this? Is, are they incongruous? Uh, are we just paying more attention? Is 24-hour 7 cable part of the problem or part of the reason? What's, 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 what's going on? Uh, David, that's the $64 million question, and Vanessa and I were actually speaking uh, about that uh, before the show began, and mm -hmm. if we had the answer to that, we would bottle it and, and not sell it. We would give it away. Um, I don't know. There's so many, you know, when you have to ask what has happened in the life of a 16-year-old that has led them to the point where they think this is the only option available to them to deal with whatever it is that they were trying to deal with and that, that they considered there were no other options available and this is what they had to do. I, I don't know what contributes to that kind now, of behavior. These things didn't happen in 1910 or 2000, 1914 or 1814, did they? We talk about that a lot. You know, we talk about people have always had issues in their lives to deal with, and they've always dealt with them somehow. Uh, like you said, uh, you know, earlier in, in your first question, uh, is, it, is it just more notoriety? Is it, uh, you know, we just have more capability to cover these things and rebroadcast these things over and over again so that there's a greater level of awareness? You know, people have always had to deal with issues throughout history and I don't know if it's the availability of firepower now you know that uh, that wasn't available once upon a time I don't know if it's the well, fact no lack of firepower available in colonial America well, maybe it's the proximity of people, you know, to, to more people that allows for, you know, a higher body count, if you will. Um, I, I don't know. If, if we knew that, 
uh, clearly would be able to interdict that. But I think a big part of this, though, uh, you know, we do a wonderful job, unfortunately. We've gotten very good at responding to these kinds of things. You know, we have to do what we can to prevent these things. We've got to get out in front of this. There's the immediate response, and then, uh, Vanessa, there's the long-term response. And this is where an agency like yours comes in, right? Correct. And, the, um, the victims are going to need a lot of care over a long period of time. Correct. Um, with our agency, we've worked in a lot of um, mass events that have happened in the past, um, LA Fitness, those large types of events where the individuals need help immediately, those immediate victims, but also the families need support as well as the community. Um, a lot of what we do is go in and do crisis response. So we will actually work with those individuals who've been, been affected in directly and indirectly. And then at that point, kind of let them know how trauma impacts them and um, let them make them more aware and educate them about different things that might trigger their responses and those are really have to do with um, all five senses so when you're going through a traumatic experience all five senses are heightened so oftentimes things that you don't even know will be a trigger for you later become a trigger so it could be a smell it could be um, if I was eating a candy bar right before it happened I'm less likely to probably want to eat that candy bar again because it's going to bring back those feelings those uncomfortable feelings um, and so when we do crisis response we go out and we educate people about what are some of the things that might happen going forward we let them know in the first few days they're going to have experience things very much like PTSD so oftentimes people say I have PTSD but we know that PTSD doesn't happen within the first few days this is a very abnormal situation and these are very normal reactions that people have you may have heard uh, or seen an interview with Brett Hurt one of the victims and he was talking about whether he'll ever be able to go back into that school and uh, specifically to that hallway where this happened. I imagine that's you know, that doesn't surprise you at all no. to hear that, but is that the kind of thing that counseling can address? Yes, yes. Basically what we would do is we would work with the victim in terms of what happened. Um, oftentimes it, it's so traumatic for them that they can't even go through the full story at one point. And so oftentimes it takes numerous um, sessions in order to be able to do that. Um, but basically to empower the person and teach them skills on how to ground themselves. Something is basic as when you're having that feeling you might stump the ground to know that you're really not re-experiencing that event that you're in the here and now um, but we do let people know that the things that they're feeling that make them feel like they're going crazy um, maybe they're not sleeping maybe they're not eating maybe they're feeling more anxious more afraid um, all of those things are normal reactions so, so you have individuals in, in need of counseling and healing and as the superintendent from Franklin Regional Indicate you have a community mm -hmm. uh, in need of healing you know when it happens in a school you know so many ripple effects so many people feel it directly We'll talk more about that when we continue here on the KDPG Sunday edition in just a moment. Welcome back to the KDPG Sunday edition. We're talking about the tragedy at Franklin Regional High School this past week and uh, some of the ripple effects and the long-term effects and the move toward healing and recovery. With us is Gene Commander, Emergency Management Coordinator for North Huntington Township. He's also part of One Star Training that uh, helps organizations and communities with security issues. And uh, Vanessa Mayer Myers is here. Mayers, excuse me, Community Engagement and Mediation Specialist for the Center for Victims. And Vanessa, we were talking about uh, the long-term recovery. And it's not just for the individuals involved, but it's for the teachers, it's for the, the staff at the hospital, some of whom uh, had children of their own who were students at Franklin Regional and went through some time not knowing uh, the fate of their students. You know, this is a community-wide wound that needs to be healed. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we did do, although we primarily work with Allegheny County, is we did reach out to the hospitals um, to ask them if they needed us to come out and meet with the families to provide support, to um, provide support for even the nurses um, and the staff of the hospitals because they're impacted by this right away. Um, one of the things that we try to do is really um, just be there to let them know what's happening, what's going on, and make our services available. We'll have not only those individuals from this event, but individuals that will be triggered for other events that have happened in the past. This will remind people so people will begin to kind of come out and call us. I mean for the LA Fitness event we had people calling on the anniversaries on a regular basis because these feelings keep coming up and they're triggered by this. So it is something that we do work with them on a long-term basis. So this is an unusual um, situation where the um, authority figures and the figures who themselves might be counted upon to provide counseling and comfort themselves need counseling and comfort and themselves were involved in this. Is that 
magnify the difficulty of this sort of thing? It does. It does. And one of the things we've done with some of the different school systems here in Allegheny County is work with teachers around trauma so that they have an understanding of it. Because when you're going through it yourself, it is different. But if you have some understanding of what's actually happening and what's taking place, it can make you feel a little more empowered. So what specifically might you say to a teacher who's both authority figure and victim? about how she or he might handle a child in some cases or a young person who himself or herself is a victim. What I specifically, would, what tools would you give this person and specifically what would you say to this person? I would say to that person, you know, basically that that child and that, that individual is both going to need um, to take it slow. They're going to need to take it slow. There are just going to be some very basic things that have to happen up front because people need to be able to make sure they eat, to be able to make sure they get some support, um, to let that child, if, it, if they need to talk about it, let them talk about it. Um, because oftentimes children need to be able to feel safe and secure. I mean, that's the first thing that mm -hmm. that, that individual needs is to feel safe and secure. So um, that would be the very first question I would ask them is if they feel safe right now and how can we, you know, make them feel safe at that moment. And then we usually um, allow people to go ahead and talk about what they're feeling, um, to validate those concerns, and then to try to prepare them um, for things that might happen going forward in terms of not only their reactions, but as I mentioned earlier, earlier in terms of triggers that might um, bring up those feelings. Is it instructive to look at uh, communities like Sandy Hook or Columbine and say, uh, yes, we know what happened there, we know how traumatic that was, but the story that may not have been told with, with as much, uh, or the story that may not have gotten as much attention is the recovery. There's been recovery, there's been healing in those communities, and it'll happen here. It will, it will, and every person deals with trauma in a different kind of way. And so when they go through counseling, um, we offer that as a supportive um, role for them. Um, and each person is different. I mean, what we can do is educate them on what will happen, what are some of the common reactions, and different people need different things. So some people will come and sit down and have therapy, and other people might use other means. Um, it might be creative means that they might use to kind of work through this. Uh, Gene, one of the first questions that came up on Wednesday was, uh, are there metal detectors at Franklin Regional High School? The answer is no, mm -hmm. and uh, the point was made that uh, many suburban school districts do not have metal detectors. Is that something that needs to be reevaluated? I'm sure it's going to be reevaluated. I'm sure there's going to be that immediate reaction to, uh, you know, what can we do? What can we do right away? Uh, why haven't we done that already? I was actually just speaking with a colleague of mine this morning from uh, Ohio about this, uh, the metal detector issue. And, um, you know, he had provided me with some information about that almost immediately uh, after this incident. And a lot of the information that he provided shows that there's really nothing definitive that points to the effectiveness uh, of metal detectors in a school setting. It's a lot different using metal detectors in a school setting than maybe what we're used to in airports or other buildings. Uh, you know, in an airport, you have a population that's arriving at that facility in a staggered way, okay? There's multiple points of entry for those metal detectors, and those metal detectors are staffed by people who know how to use them and know what to do, not know how to interdict if there is something found. You know, if, if, you, if you follow that path and, and implement metal detectors and that process in school buildings, you know, who's going to monitor these things? You know, you have, you have the entire student population showing up at the same time every morning. I mean, classes start, you know, in my school district at the high school at about 7.20. You know, these kids are going to have to get there at 6 o'clock in the morning to push 1,500 kids through uh, metal detectors. But it's being done. It's being done every day at schools in the, in the Pittsburgh public schools and in some other suburban districts. And it's not as if this, there's no, there are no answers to the questions that you're answering. Schools have figured out a way to do it. it is, it's one of the answers. And if that answer, is it applicable now to... Uh, is it going to be a blanket approach? Is that the singular answer? Uh, you know, each school district could have to look at this, uh, you know, individually because obviously there's a cost factor involved. Um, uh, again, is there, I don't know if there's a liability factor involved. Uh, there's certainly a proficiency factor involved. There's a process that has to be put in place, you know, to, to make sure these things don't work on their own. So there are many costs involved here. Some of them are obvious, the costs of um, <clears throat> trauma on a young person or on a community, uh, the actual uh, uh, financial, economic cost, and also the cost to the social fabric. And are you troubled, or how do we deal with the, the notion that um, a um, innocent and maybe meek-looking 16-year-old 
with no apparent um, other uh, indicators may be a mortal threat. How do we deal with that in the community? Before I'm an emergency management coordinator, I'm a parent, and I have the same concerns. I send my daughter off to you know the high school in my district every morning, and um, I want to believe that she's safe. And as parents, we all want to believe that. And as a result of that, sometimes you know we we're in denial that you know the school is a safe place. If I'm going to send my child anywhere, you know, for it to be safe, it's a school. Well, we're finding less and you know that's less and less the case. I think, like I said earlier, we've got to get out in front of this, okay? The first line of defense isn't at the school building, it's not at the school door, it's not at the metal detector, it's, it's at home. You know, the, the parents really have to generate, uh, we have to generate a, a higher level of awareness on the part of the parents. We have to make it acceptable, we have to create a culture where it's okay that when you see something, you can say something, okay? If, if you have an observation of a change in behavior or something like that, you know, you know you're supposed to do the right thing and report it. I think probably you, you mentioned an article in the paper uh, earlier this morning about the response to the incident. I think there was a more prevalent article in, in the paper this morning that spoke to the supposed hit list uh, at Gateway High School and the fact that the, any harm from that was prevented because the parents of the child who composed that list found it and notified some, someone. That's the first line. It, it has to start there. Now, you know, we're in prevention mode. We're in interdiction mode. We're not in response mode. That's an obvious end. Let's all salute the, let's all salute the fact that this happened, the hit list situation. But um, do you worry also about community and social paranoia going out of this? I, I, you, yeah, I do. I do, because you have to be careful. I think one of the things that schools struggle with themselves in the conversations that I've had with uh, officials at my own school district is, uh, you know, overreaction, overreaching. You have, to, you have to have a process in place that, you know, if somebody uh, with the best intentions provides the school district with information about something that they have observed and they have done the right thing. Now the school district's on the receiving end of that information. Do they have a process in place to receive that information, to process that information, to, to synthesize that information, to apply that information, essentially to do the right thing with that information? And you're talking about the life of a, of a young child here, okay? So they're getting information in about, you know, something a young child may be planning or may be considering or may be having problems dealing with, and you want to respond to that correctly because if you don't, now you've, you know, potentially caused additional conflict in the life of that child and that child's family. So yeah, there's a, there's a line that has to be managed there between awareness, interdiction, involvement, and the use the term you used, you know, uh, social or community paranoia. You yeah, can only imagine the amount of, uh, of, of sensitivity, uh, responsibility, um, thoughtfulness that it takes on the part of school administrators to handle those types of things. I, I want to ask you, Vanessa, just a couple of minutes to go. Has the explosion of social media changed the response to incidents like this? Has it changed the recovery? Has it changed what you do when it comes to counseling? I think it has, um, and I would say because it's out there more. Um, lots of, everybody is able to find out about what's happening, when it's happening, on the spot. Sometimes it's good information, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes it's reliable, and other times it isn't. But it does, it does impact people because, you know, if they're watching something on TV, they're seeing it constantly, if they're hearing about it on Facebook, if they're hearing about it, if it's being tweeted, all those different things that are happening, it's constantly in their face. And so it's something that, in therapy, is something that they do talk about um, with the therapist. Imagine, uh, I'm just taking a guess here, that maybe one of the best things a counselor could say was, would be avoid social media. To limit it, to limit that exposure, and especially even with children, limiting that exposure is, is important because those images, um, especially if they're on television or just hearing about it constantly, is right there in their face when they're trying to go through that process of getting through that situation. Well, that's just, yeah, just unfortunately, we're well, I guess time. not. Yeah, okay. right, right out of time. I apologize. Thank I'm you sorry. to both of you, Thank Vanessa you. Mayers, Gene Commander. Appreciate you being here. We'll take a break back with uh, some final thoughts in a moment. Thank you for joining us today. The KDPG Sunday edition a reminder now being seen once again at 1130 after Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer. So we hope you can join us next Sunday morning at 1130 for the KDPG Sunday edition. For David Shribben, I'm Ken Rice. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.